And happy Sabbath. Are you guys happy to be here today? Are you guys happy that it's a Sabbath day? Yes. Were we all blessed today? I don't know about you, but this week has been a little bit difficult. There's been so much going on apart from organizing this event as well like as exams. But I hope that we can all realize that we have gone through another week and that we stand here today blessed with a bright and new day that it's Sabbath and that we're all celebrating it together. Um, we have the theme, Incorruptible, as discussed from last night. Our focus was to first bring awareness to the corruption and to the tests that we face each and every day. And the difference between knowing what is right and actually applying what we know. And for today, we will also be continuing with this theme as we find not only the solution, but also see and take another look on how Jesus did it when it was him who was facing all of these tests that we also can face today. We have some announcements. Um, first is we have two new members that have joined Ahija Ministry. By God's grace, we have Sophia and Johnny. Um, for those who would like to join the ministry as well, you are more than welcome. Just approach any member, and we welcome you guys with open arms if you guys are willing and diligent to serve God. Another one is all the papers, the colored papers that you guys were able to receive. Those will be for our commentary box. We encourage you guys to write your comments on the event or any uh, questions that you guys might have during this topic that we will be discussing, as well as prayer requests that we can help you pray about. Also, we have an AY program this afternoon. Sorry. We have an AY program this afternoon at 2.30. Uh, please come so that we can all finish off the Sabbath day together once again. Um, next Sabbath uh, is the 9th. It'll be the African Congregation Sabbath. So everyone as well is welcome to join. Uh, at this time, I'll just call up Brother Trust. Um, he has a short announcement. Smile, you guys. You guys are so frowning. I don't know why. It's Sabbath, right? <laughs> OK, Brother Trust. Uh, thank you, Sister Amira. Yepi uh, Sabbath, everyone. Uh, it's good to be here. No, you guys are... Uh, did we have breakfast? <laughs> it's good to be here. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, wonderful. Yeah, that's a, a little more life. Um, we welcome you to our anniversary as Aija Ministry. Um, I'm going to... Aija ministry is a media ministry. So the good thing that you are here, you're gonna have a benefit of getting a little bit of some, uh, uh, of some good things with regards to media ministry. Some of you have attended a seminar in IAS that I, I, we, I did on media evangelism. And so for the benefit of those that could not make it, you're gonna have a, a cupcake, just a very, a very small uh, things to learn about uh, media ministry. So, but before I do that, I want to just give you a reminder again uh, for the camp meeting that we are going to be having this December in Laguna. For those that have not registered, please, you can see the church treasurer, uh, Brother Ondari, or you can see me, uh, Brother Ondari is over there. So you can see him and register your names. Uh, right now we have uh, about 60 people that have just registered to, to, to join us this December but they have not paid, so we, we still need their money. And we hope we can uh, go and get blessed. Our theme for the camp meeting is wait. So there's a lot in store for us, and we hope that we, we can join and get blessed uh, this, this December. May the Lord bless us. Um, I'm going to give you a, a very brief talk. Is the mic working? Hello. Okay, that's better. Right. Um, 
can you move to the next slide, the, 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 the first one? Right. I'm going to give you a, a, a very summarized talk on media evangelism. Uh, how many of us are on social media? I, I love to see the audience that I'm talking about. Uh, do you know what is social media? What is it? It's pretty much Facebook. Yeah, those that uh, I'm sure all of us are on Facebook. Who is not on Facebook here? Let me see. Let's be honest, we're in church. Uh, there's one person over there. Who else is not on Facebook? How many of us use Facebook regularly? Like, one, two, uh, three, four, oh, okay, quite a number of you. All right. How many of us post videos of kids on Facebook? <laughs> be honest, we're in church. But it, it, it's all right. Uh, okay. Uh, right. We, we, as Aija Ministry, our main emphasis is to use the media that we have around us in spreading the good news about Christ. And uh, I'm sure you saw a few videos that we played here uh, with members of the ministry sharing their favorite text. Much of this content we share it on our Facebook page, on our Facebook page. It's called Aija Ministry. And we also have a website called aijaministry.org. You can log in and check some of most of this content. You can see it there. But don't do that right now. We're in church. You do that after the, after the program. Uh, so we have discovered that we live in an age where most of us are connected using our cell phones, right? Uh, the, we have never been, I'm sure you know that, the world has never been more connected than the time we're living in now. Uh, people are much, much more connected now. You can just send an instant message right now and it goes to Africa in the next three seconds or less than that. And you are able to communicate. And so the thing now, the question is, how do we use these media platforms? Uh, now, that's a fundamental question. How do we use these? And what do we use them for? So, these are things that I always have a passion of trying to address. How to use media in a way that uh, is not destructive? Because as much as media is a good thing, it, one way or the other, it's uh, quite destructive. Before I get into it, I want to read this quote here. I, I, I like it. It's by a, uh, Joel Shatterland. He's a media evangelist. He says that in most people's minds, there is an apparent contrast between religion and movies, pastors, and filmmakers. But I believe that this dichotomy does not exist. In a movie, the story, the drama, the music, they all blend together to create the most powerful, culture-changing weapon of our time. How many people watch movies? Just raise your hand while in church and be honest. Uh, how many of you watch movies? I've always heard preachers and pastors saying that movies are wrong. I want to say that that's a, a false and a, a wrong statement. You can't say that. Okay? Not all movies are bad. People that would say that don't go to the theater, it's, it's wrong to do that. Uh, I... I beg to differ. I'm a media evangelist. I, 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 I believe that this can influence people. If a film can influence people's dress, uh, we know that. Some of us, sometimes, even the way we dress, yes, we get our dress code from the stars that we watch in the movies, our haircut. We get it from the movies. Our language, we get it from the movies. And sometimes it's not necessarily a good thing what we get from that. And I believe the opposite of that is also true. Good oh, films yes, can influence yes. us for the right thing. They can influence us for the right cause. Are we, are we together? The, 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 our church has also managed to produce some films that have, that have made an impact. Uh, there's a movie, Tell the World. Can you go to the next slide? Let me see if I have that. Okay, just wait on this one. Uh, how many of you saw this film? Uh, quite a number of you. Uh, this film was not done by an Adventist... Uh, uh, it, was done, it was not done by an Adventist filmmaker. Uh, but it was the story of uh, one Adventist. And one thing I loved about this film, I watched it, it's called Huxorage. One thing I loved about it is that after this film was previewed in Europe, you will be surprised, the most popular term to be searched in all of Europe on Google, do you know what it was? The question that they were searching on Google, the question was, who are Seventh-day Adventists? After they saw this movie, people were, were trying to inquire, who are these people? 
I mean, how could somebody live such a dramatic life that is uh, well, uh, uh, well lived? And uh, we know that Europe is a first world uh, region, and uh, most people there are not very religious. No, they're not. But after they saw a film like this one, they had to actually inquire and say, I mean, who are these people? And they wanted to know more about it. And so the point is that much of this content that we have around us, uh, films and all that, they can have a good cause and do have a good cause if they are used the right way. And I always advocate that let's be in the forefront as Christians in producing content that is able to have an impact to the world. As much as a, a movie in Hollywood can have a, a huge impact in uh, changing people's lifestyle, you know, in advocating the message that they advocate, we as believers, we can also do the same thing. I'm not saying go and become filmmakers, but the point is that w media has an influence in the world we live around us. Uh, simply a good, uh, a good example of that is the cell phone that you have around, your cell phone. Um, if you look at uh, your phone, uh, a phone before used to be, it used to have a, a, a larger keypad and a very smaller screen. Uh, are we together? I don't know if some of you were born by that time. A cell phone used to look like a calculator. You know your scientific calculator? A cell phone used to look like that. And uh, one way or the other, as time went on, it developed to, to have uh, maybe half of the, of the phone was a screen and half of the phone was a keypad until uh, the iPhone came in and the, the phone was what? was just all screen, they removed the, 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 the keypad. Why did they do that? People are now becoming visual. They, uh, we are more inclined to, uh, to be attracted to things that are visual than anything else. That's why uh, I'm gonna show you some, of, uh, some things here. Can you move to the next slide? Let me see what we have here. Um, okay, this was the set of the film that they were producing, uh, uh, the film Tell the World, the production crew of that. Uh, can you move to the next one? Okay, this is your, your, your olden day television for those who are not born. And I'm, I'm going to uh, show you some of this later on. Uh, let's move to, uh, to the next slide. Right, okay, let's, uh, let me say this first. For those that don't know, what is media? Uh, a simple definition of that it would be, it is the main means of mass communication, things that we have around us to communicate. And in today's age, what we have as the mainstream media is the internet access to internet to be able to communicate and to talk uh, with people. So all of that is pretty much regarded uh, as media. Can I see the, the next slide and see what we have here? Uh, Ellen White, I love this quote. She says that we must take every justifiable means of bringing light before the people. Some of the methods used in this work will be different from the methods used in the past. She wrote this quote in 1902, but she realized that the way we do evangelism is going to be changing uh, as time goes by. Uh, people back then used to meet under trees and have uh, crusades and all of that, and you know, and you know, so, uh, and you have meetings and fellowship. But then now on, we we can have uh, a live stream of our program, and people can watch this all over the world, and they can watch it on Facebook. What, what does that mean? Um, the way we evangelize and the way we do evangelism we has changed dramatically. And as young people who are all on social media, I urge you that have a, a revised view of how you use media. Don't just go on Facebook and just log on and all the things you do, just gossip about people and you know, just uh, laugh at useless pictures and all that. Uh, your presence on social media must have a positive impact as a Christian young person. That's my message, actually. That when you are using social media, make sure that you are leading people to Christ. Your presence online should actually have a positive influence towards leading people to Christ. Are we, are we following? I hope we, we, I hope we learn something from that. Let's see what we have here. Uh, but let's go back to bed. Okay, yeah, this one. I, I, I'll give you a few facts here. Uh, I've given this before, some of you remember. It says that our population now is about 7 billion, and they say that 2.3 billion people use social media, and most of these people, they use about 64% of their time checking Facebook. That's, uh, that's dramatic. Uh, and internet users about more than 3 billion people. That's how much people are online. And so you are saying, People, 64% of their time, they spend it uh, using Facebook. I was taking some of this uh, on Pew Research, 
they were saying that people that work today in offices, people that work in front of a computer, they use more than 70% of their time on Facebook. I'm talking about people that go on former work, you know, secretaries, presidents, wherever they are. As long as you've got an office that has got a screen in front of you, they use about 70% of their time at work using Facebook. I'm not going to comment about the, the good and bad about that. But the point is that people have, are much more connected using these means of communication, using media. And what are we doing about it as young people or as believers? I urge you to, to start being effective. Uh, you cannot all become, uh, maybe, you can't all become graphic designers, you can't all become cameramen, you can't become photographers. But the phone that you have, your cell phone, and your connection to, to social media, that can be a good start of a positive change, of bringing about the right message to, to the people. Are we learning something? Uh, and if you have questions, please, you can actually raise your hand and ask. I will be glad to, to answer. Let me see what we have here. Okay, this one says uh, social media users have been, uh, you have risen by about seven, 176 million in the last year, and about 1 million new active users are on social media. And uh, Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp, they handle over 60 billion messages a day. This shows you how much the world is connected. Uh, but the question is, how are we using these good tools to spread uh, the gospel? Um, and then Facebook now sees an average of 8 billion uh, daily video views from over 500 million users. The last one is striking. Do you know what is Super Bowl in the US? Have you heard about it? What is Super Bowl? Uh, I'm, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Uh, let me just explain this so that you get the context of it. Uh, uh, companies, they pay U.S. cable television network uh, about 10 million for, a, sorry, it's 30 seconds advert, not 10 seconds. Uh, 10 million U.S. dollars for a 30 seconds advert. They do this mostly during the Super Bowl when everybody's glued on their screens. So companies like Nike, they would go to, to cable television networks to advertise their product. They would pay about 30 million, ab about uh, sorry, $10 million for a 30 seconds advert. What does that mean? If the world knows how much, if they can invest so much money on media, they know that these things have influence. They know that. Uh, you, 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 you can't be blind to it. Uh, gone are the days when we should be asking, is it good to be on Facebook or not? I don't think that's a, 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 a good question myself. I, I, I don't find that as a, as a very good question. The point is that uh, if we're on Facebook, the question should be, how are we using these platforms? And let's use them in a way that uplifts God. Let's use them in a way that points people towards God. Uh, but again, being on social media, it also brings out its own challenges. Because uh, going on social media is not a substitute to coming to church to say, you know, today I'm gonna just going to sleep and watch my sermon on Facebook or on YouTube and not go to church. Uh, those are some of the challenges. But then if there's no way for you to come, of course, I mean, maybe if you're sick or anything else, you can probably be excused for that. But this is not an excuse or a substitute for a church. It's not. We are simply saying that we are understanding that the world is much more connected now than it ever was. And so how are we using these tools to evangelize? How are we using these tools to spread the message of truth to the world? And I believe that we can all do that and we can all start. And so... As a ministry, uh, in Asia Mist, we have embraced this call in such a way that we try by all means to use, uh, mostly we, we are active on Facebook, to use our Facebook page mostly in evangelism by the content that we share. And I want to thank God that we have managed to get very mass massive feedbacks from people all over the world. Pretty much all over the world, people have actually been getting back to us and actually some of them, they compliment the work we do some of them would want further Bible study and all of that because of the content that we share as a ministry. And I'm saying that my challenge to you is that that's something that you can do. You don't need to be probably in a ministry for you to do that. But what you need to do is to, the way you interact daily, your daily process with your friends, with your people, you can use media in a way that is positive, in a way that can lead people towards God.
Uh, before I end, I'm going to read a text. Uh, one of our texts that we, we, we have uh, as our mission is in John 17, verse 3, that says, And this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God. In other words, for people, for the world to know the true God, that is what life is. That's the eternal life, to know Christ as our Lord and Savior. And so, my calling is I would love to see more young people being active in ministry. One way or the other, different talents that we have, we are not all media professionals, I understand that. Uh, we are not all musicians, but I believe each and everyone who is sitting right here looking at me right now is a gift that God gave him. And my, call, my, my message is that use that gift to lead people towards God. Don't use your gift to mislead people or lead them away from God. Are we together? I'm going to read from uh, Luke chapter 10. Uh, it talks about what mission really is. Uh, it's not as... Uh, okay, let me read this first, then I'm, then I'm going to talk. Uh, Luke chapter 10, uh, verse 1 to verse 3. It says here, uh, after, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and placed them where he himself was about to go. Verse 2, And then he said unto them, The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send you more laborers in the harvest. Verse 3, it says that, Go your way, behold, I send you as lamps among wolves. That's uh, striking for me. And what it simply says is that mission is not as easy. Christ is saying that I'm going to be sending you as lamps among wolves. The mission field out there is not as sweet or as easy as we may think. It's difficult. It's got challenges. But it needs us to be committed. And if we stay committed to God's word and use calling, we can all become effective missionaries. We can all become effective evangelists for the Lord. And may the Lord help us as we continue to worship through the day. Have a blessed Sabbath. Happy Sabbath once again. Happy Sabbath. Wow. <coughs> Happy Sabbath. Okay. Looks better. So let's go to the slogan. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. Happy day. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Thank you. So we're going to start our inspiration for the divine service. But before that, let's pray. Father God in heaven, we want to thank you, Lord, for being with us. For this moment, oh Lord, that we come to the divine hour. We know that the Father devil is striving to make things go wrong. But we know also, Father, and we have the assurance that in Christ we are more than conquerors. That whatever thing we're going to do today, we have the assurance that your hand is guiding us. And everything will happen according to thy will. Now as we sing, Father, may your angels come down and sing with us. And your spirit be with us. And in harmony and unity we may sing all in one. Forgive our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing a short chorus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, it's a very known song. Oh, friend, do you love Jesus? Yes, I love Jesus. How sure do you love Jesus? Then why do you love Jesus?
Number 253, there's no other name like Jesus. We're going to sing now there is a praise of quiet rest as the participants are going to come in. Jesus bless with him.
Let's all kneel and sing holy, holy, holy. Hap Sabbath Church. Hap Sabbath. Uh, for our call to worship today, uh, I will be reading the book To Be Like Jesus of our sister Ellen G. White. Um, on the page 116, second paragraph, it says, The importance of the Sabbath as the memorial of a creation is that it keeps ever present the true reason why worship is due to God. Because he is the creator and we are his creatures. The Sabbath, therefore, lies at the very foundation of our divine worship for it teaches us the great truth in the most impressive manner and the, no other institution does this the true ground of the divine worship not of that on the seventh day merrily but of all worship is found in the distinction between the creator and his creatures. This great fact can never be, can never become obsolete and must never be forgotten. We worship God because he has made us. This is the true reason why worship is due to God. So whenever we come to the house of God, Vespers, midweek, Sabbath worship, sundown or sunrise worship, whatever kind of worship we do, we always need to keep it in mind that our worship is due to God because we are his creatures. Gracious Lord, please have mercy upon us and manifest yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
for Sabbath expression, we're going to sing the theme song, Victory in Jesus. Scripture reading is found in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1, and I'm reading in New King, King James Version. Uh, verse 3 says, He is despised and re rejected by men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Let's kneel. Now, dear Lord, as we pray.
Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for life this morning. I want to thank you, Father, for bringing us here as we worship. We want to dedicate ourselves before you, Lord. May you forgive us all our transgressions. May you humble us, Father, as we come before you. We want to ask that you may be with each and every individual who is here this morning. Lord, whatever they are going through, whatever their difficulties, whatever their challenges, I pray that, Lord, those may be rebuked in Jesus' name. I pray that, Lord, you may all bring us closer to you, Father. May by the end of this service, Lord, we can all testify and say, we have seen Jesus and truly we have been with the Lord. I also pray, Father, for our speaker this morning. May you use him, Lord, in a mighty way that all glory may be given unto you. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. For our thoughts on stewardship this morning, uh, we will be turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7 says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Our deacons are now ready to serve the Lord.
Father God, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you have poured into our lives, that we are able and that we are capable of giving unto you. Lord, you are the reason and the source for all the things that have come into our lives. And I pray that you may accept all that we have given unto you. May we continue to be reminded that in all that we do, may we be faithful and may we be faithful stewards unto your mission. May your words continue to, uh, continue to, continue to be spread around the world and may this be a contribution to that mission. We ask these things in your name we pray, amen.
Let us pray. Father in heaven, may you please abide with me. In Jesus' name, I pray and we pray. Amen. Who has believed our message? I need a microphone, a wireless microphone. Who has believed our message? He was despised, rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Despised, rejected sorrows, grief, despised. Surely, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did not esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. We have bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own own way and jehovah hath laid on him the iniquity of us all he was oppressed yet when he was afflicted he of opened not his mouth as a lamb that is led to the slaughter and as a sheep that before its shearer is dumb so he opened not his mouth by oppression and judgment he was taken away for the, his generation living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due and they made his grave with the wicked although he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased Jehovah to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, justify many, and he shall bear their iniquity. He poured out his soul unto death, 
and was numbered with transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressions. Against all odds is the title of today's sermon. For he grew up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. A tender plant out of a dry ground. He has no form, nor comeliness, no beauty that we should desire him. Luke, in fulfillment of Isaiah 53, records this. And Jesus grew. Isaiah 53 verse 2 says, He grew up before him as a tender plant. He was gentle. He was loving. He was caring. No sin. No mistake. As a tender plant in dry ground. Luke 2.52, and Jesus grew in wisdom mentally and in stature physically and in favor with God spiritually and in favor with man socially. He was balanced and Jesus' spiritual growth was balanced. But he grew against all odds. Luke chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, come with me to the book of Luke. Chapter 1, we're looking at verse 26 to verse 27. If your cell phones are still on, please turn them off. Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 26. Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 27. Verse 26 reads, Now in the sixth month, six months since Elizabeth was pregnant, the mother of John the Baptist, the Bible says that she became pregnant in the fullness of time. After six months, what happened? The angel Gabriel, who is Jesus' guardian angel, he will show up later on also, we will see that, was sent from God to a city in Galilee called, hello? Hello? Nazareth. To a virgin. That word actually means young girl. To a young girl engaged to a man whose name was Joseph. Now, other versions say betrothed. In truth, they were not yet really, really married. They were only betrothed. This used to happen before they would get married. Now, some commentators say this. Walter L. Liefeld says this. Since betrothal often took place, soon after what? Hello? Hello? It took after what? After puberty. Mary may have just entered what? Her teens. This relationship, betrothal, was legally binding, but intercourse was not permitted until? Back then, when people were to get married, first they would get betrothed. And when you were betrothed, it was the woman had the same rights as a wife would have. And when this happened, they were usually betrothed at puberty, when they were in their teens. So when you think of Mary, you think of a grown woman. Mary was not a grown woman. Only divorce or death could severe betrothal. It was similar to marriage, but it was not. Only divorce and death could end it. Howard Marshall says this. Betrothal could take place as early as... Hello? Keep the numbers in mind. As early as 12 years old and usually lasted for about a year. Although it was regarded as equally binding as marriage, the girl having the same legal position as a wife, it was not normal for intercourse to take place during this period. One more. We do not know how old Mary was, but she was not yet have living with Joseph. We know that they were betrothed in their teens. They say 12. I want to do this. Let's put 12 because 12 is the first number. I mean, it's a low number that they give. Let's go for 13. And if you don't like 13, let me suggest 14. I can even go to 15. Let's just say, for example, she was 15 when she was 
betrothed because she was betrothed when she was a teenager. That's a fact. That's the customs. And Jews were legalists. They were strict in obeying their customs. She was a descendant of Judah. And so she was faithful to her heritage. And so were the Israelites. So here you have a teenager, Mary. She's betrothed to another man. They are not yet supposed to have intercourse, though today we have intercourse even before betrothal, even before presentation, even before marriage. We just go ahead. But they were not supposed to do this. So now listen very carefully. If Mary is pregnant, something has to happen. Ellen White says this. There were those who tried to cast contempt upon him, upon Jesus. Because of his what? His birth. And even in his childhood, he had to meet their scornful looks and evil whispers, gossip. Mary comes, Joseph, I'm pregnant. Oh. The Bible says that Joseph was a righteous man. So he wanted to divorce her in secret so that she will not be stoned. Why? I'm pregnant. Oh, you're pregnant. What she's, to, to Joseph, she's saying, I'm sorry. I broke the vow. I, 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 I have, they are not married, but it's legally binding like marriage, so it might as well be adultery. So Joseph says, it's okay. I'm going to divorce you in secret. She says, wait, 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 wait. It's not what you think. I didn't cheat on you. No, sister, come on. You are pregnant. So what are you saying? You woke up the next day, and boom, you're pregnant. Put yourself in Joseph's shoes. How are you pregnant? A teen. And she has to explain why. No, an angel came. Ah, uh, don't put God in this. An angel came. It was the Holy Spirit. Some people would say, you're not blaming the Holy Spirit. Conceived through the Spirit. Joseph was not convinced. An angel came to him and told him, my friend, the one in that womb is the last hope. She's telling the truth. Okay, that's done. Joseph is convinced. What about the neighbors who know they are betrothed, one year has not passed, and now she's pregnant? Mary was not forced to accept this. When the angel came, he greeted her and he told her. She could have said, no, I don't want to. God does not go against our free will. And she could have said, no. Mary had a lot to think about. What am I going to say to Joseph? What am I going to say to my father, to my mother? What am I going to say to my church members? What am I going to say to my neighbors? Everyone knows we are betrothed. I should not be pregnant now. It shouldn't happen now. What will I say to them? What will people say? They will not believe me. How can I say it is through the Holy Spirit? Who in the history of Israel, even in the Old Testament, you saw that through the Holy Spirit they conceived? How will she explain this to people? It seemed that she had to stand alone. Mary was faithful to God. I want you to look at verse 31. Come with me to verse 31. And behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call him Jesus. 35. The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason the Holy Child shall be called the son of God. Verse 37. She was scared. So verse 37, the angel says, for nothing will be impossible with... What will people say? How will I explain it to people? Even if I tell them it's the Holy Spirit, they will accuse me of blasphemy. And I'll probably get stoned. What is impossible with men is possible with God. Verse 38, and Mary said, behold, the bond servant of the Lord. She said, I am a servant of the Lord. 
When she says, behold, the bond servant of the Lord, she's saying, I accept it. I don't care what they will say. I don't know if Joseph is going to understand and accept, but you said it. I am your bond servant. Behold, the bond servant of the Lord may it be done to me according to your word. Your word. Remember that. And the angel departed from her. Luke 2.42, we've looked at that. Desire of Ages says this. I want you to pay attention with me. We're going to read a lot today. From the time when the parents of Jesus found him in the temple, he was 12 years old. We're now looking at Jesus' childhood. And most of his childhood is recorded in the spirit of prophecy. Not so much in the Bible. It doesn't go into details. But he, when he was 12, he was in the temple. Don't read what's there, huh? Don't go ahead of me. When he was 12, he went to the temple. He stayed behind. He did not get lost. He did it on purpose. Let's read. From the time when the parents of Jesus found him in the temple, his course of action was a mystery to them. He would not enter into controversy. Yet, his example was a constant lesson. See, my yesterday spoke about setting a good example. He seemed as one who was set apart. His hours of happiness were found alone with nature and with God to meditate in the green valleys when he was a small boy to hold communion with God the early morning meditating searching the scriptures not Facebook or Twitter or Viber or in prayer return to his home to take his duties again so Jesus would be working during the day and sometimes he would take a break from his work and he would go to meditate. And then he would come back and resume his work. So Jesus wasn't just reading the Bible every day. He was also working. He had chores and he did many other things. Because the life of Jesus, listen closely, condemned evil, he was opposed both at... Hello? Both at and abroad, his unselfishness and integrity were commented on with sneer. His forbearance, long patience, and his kindness were termed cowardice. This guy is a coward. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't fight back. He's a coward. Ellen White says they used to call Jesus a coward. If he had responded by an impatient word or look, if he had connected his brothers with his brothers by even one wrong act, he would have failed to be, of being a perfect example. Thus, he would have failed to carry out the plan of our redemption had he even admitted, listen very carefully, had he even admitted that there could be an excuse for sin, there is never a time where it is okay to go against God's will. There is never an excuse to sin. There is never an excuse to do wrong. That doesn't happen. Satan would have triumphed and the world would have been lost. If Jesus would have sinned, we would be eternally lost. Look at what else the spirit of prophecy says. This is interesting. There were some who sought his society. People loved to be around Jesus, feeling at peace in his presence. But many avoided him because they were rebuked by his stainless life. You know, sometimes there are people, I don't know if you've experienced this, once I was talking to someone, and then someone else comes, and the person just says, I don't like that person. I said, why? No, I just don't like them. In Portuguese, we say, "Não fui com a cara dele, ou com a cara dela." I, I just don't like them. I just don't like them. He was bright and cheerful. They enjoyed his presence and welcomed his ready suggestions. Jesus was someone in his childhood when he was young. People wanted to hear from him. 
People longed to be in his presence. They longed to talk to him. They longed to hear from him. But they were impatient at his scruples and pronounced him narrow and straight-laced. Jesus answered, Jesus answered, it is written, how shall a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it in accordance with the word of? That's Psalms 119 verse 9. Ellen White says when he was under this pressure, he would quote the Bible. In Luke chapter 4, don't read yet, don't read yet, Jesus goes to Nazareth. Luke 4, 16 says he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as it was his custom, he entered the synagogue and stood forth to read. So Jesus comes to his hometown. His family are there, the church members are there, and he stands up, he reads from Isaiah. And then Jesus says, this that I have read, the prophecy of the Messiah, I am the Messiah, I have come. By the way, verse 16 says that this was on a Sabbath. This was on a Saturday. The Bible says they listened and they marveled at the gracious words that proceeded forth from his lips. And people began to shout amen and to respond. When Jesus now told them, listen, this is referring to me. I have come. They said, is this not Joseph's son? Yeah. If, if Buddhisai was there, he says, uh, this boy, I don't like jokes. <laughs> this boy thinks he's funny now. You are who? We saw you going up and down here in the village. You. You are the son of who? He says, I'm the son of God. You see, Jesus' life and example testified that he was the son of God. Ellen White says this. But to every temptation, he had one answer. In Luke 4, he also goes into the wilderness. And when the devil comes to him, Jesus began answering him saying this. It is written, it is written, it is written three times in response to the devil's temptation. Ellen White says this, but to every temptation, he had one answer. It is, it is, you won't know it is written if you don't read what is written. Listen to me. You know, Friday night when I was, I couldn't sleep. So I took the spirit of prophecy. I didn't want to look in the spirit of prophecy, actually. I just wanted to look at the Bible and do research. I didn't want to look at the spirit of prophecy, but I couldn't sleep. So I started reading. I almost did not preach this message. Almost. I think I was scared. It's going to get heavy. It is written, he rarely rebuked any wrongdoing of his brothers. But he had a word from God to speak to? To speak to? To them. Judas used to steal money in the treasury. Jesus and the disciples had a treasury, their savings. When they would go out on mission trips, and they would save it in there, it's in the book of Luke, you find this. And when Mary, Mag Mary Magdalene came in to wash Jesus' feet, Judas said, we could have used this to, we could have sold this and given to the poor, but the Bible says he was lying, he was actually a thief, he used to steal from the treasury. Listen, Jesus knew he was stealing from the treasury. You don't find one text in scripture where Jesus says, you Judas, you have been stealing in the treasury. You, Jesus did not banish him. It doesn't mean Jesus condoned what he did. The Bible, Ellen White says he rarely rebuked any wrongdoing. Sometimes you have to le let it flow. Sometimes you have to allow things to develop and to ripen so that the true fruits may be seen. Often he was accused of cowardice Simply because he did not respond immediately. Judas was stealing all these years. He said nothing. As though he didn't know. 
for refusing to unite with them in some forbidden act. They would try to, to lead Jesus to do something wrong, his friends, his brothers. But he said, no, I'm not going to do it. And because he didn't do it, they called him a coward. And this is the reason why some of us cheat in exams. But his answer was, it is the fear of the Lord that is wisdom. And to depart from evil, it is understanding. Often he was asked, this is Ellen White. Often he was asked, why are you bent on being singular and so different from us all? They asked Jesus. He said, it is written, Blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his, his, if you don't keep his testimonies, you're not blessed. If you don't walk in his law, you're not blessed. When questioned why he did not join the frolics of the youth of Nazareth, he said, it is written, I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimony as much as in all riches I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect upon thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. Again and again he was asked, Why do you submit to such despiteful usage when from your brothers, he said, it is written, My son, Forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments for length of days and long life and peace. They shall add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the tablet of thy heart so that thou shalt find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and in the sight of men. Repeatedly as... As youths, and as people put pressure on him to do wrong, Jesus would say, it is written, it is written. As a young boy, raising pressure from his friends, pressure from his neighbors, trying to lead him to do something wrong, he would never do it. There was a time, I cannot put everything, it's too much, it's really too much, that his brothers used to make fun of the poor. When they would make fun of the poor, Jesus would wait for them to leave. He would come back and speak words of encouragement. He would take his food and go give to the hungry after his brothers would make fun of them. Having said that, let me introduce you to Jesus' brother. John chapter 7. Come with me to the book of John. Hello? Can you do me a favor? I want you all to stand. Can you stand? Can you stand? Now, verse 3. Let's read verse 3. Let's read verse 3. Therefore, this is John chapter 7 verse 3. Therefore, his brothers sent to him, said to him, Leave here and go into Judea, so that your disciples may see, may see, remember that, your works which you are doing. Verse 5. For not even his brothers were believing in? Not even his brothers were believing in? Take a seat, please. His friends did not believe in him. His friends did not like him. That's outside. In his house, his brothers thought he was crazy. Okay? His brothers did not believe in him. Now, what do you mean his brothers? Does this mean that Joseph and Mary had other sons? No. This betrothal with Mary by Joseph, Joseph was already previously married. And Joseph had children. Before, hello? Listen, it's going to get intense. Joseph was previously married. And he had children in that marriage. And then he's betrothed to the teen. Mary, I don't want to say 12. That's what commentators say. And that's likely true. Even 13 is safer. I want to take it all the way up to 16. 
When he gets married to her, Mary is a mother, not only to Jesus, but probably children her age. Hello? Hello? So Mary is in this home. She's a mother to Jesus, and she's a mother to people who are probably her age. Imagine the situation. Jesus had stepbrothers. If you have stepfather, stepmother, or maybe your parents are separated, you can understand. I, I have never experienced, but I've talked to many, the pressure and the type of things that goes on in the home when parents don't have a good relationship, when father cheats on mother, mother on father, when you have a stepbrother, stepsister, you know what goes on in the home. Jesus outside was despised. In his home, the family was not stable. He had brothers who were actually not really his brother. Why? Because Mary conceived through the Spirit. He didn't have the blood of Joseph. Those brothers, they are not really his brother. Hello? And Jesus is the youngest. His brothers, as the sons of Joseph were called, sided with the rabbis. Jesus' other problem was the rabbis. They insisted that the traditions must be heeded as if, as if they were a requirement of God. So the rabbis insisted that traditions had to be equal with the word of God. They even regarded the precepts of men more highly than the word of God. They were greatly annoyed at the clear penetration of, this is the rabbis. They hated Jesus. In distinguishing between false and, Jesus always told the truth. When they would teach false teachings, Jesus would say, I love you so much that I cannot allow you to teach false doctrine, nor can I allow people to believe false doctrine. You are wrong. He was still young when he was doing this. So they hated him. The Bible says his strict obedience, like Daniel Sodrick in the mission, he would not be moved. If the Bible said so, it's final. His strict obedience to the law of God, they condemned as stubbornness. They were surprised at the knowledge and wisdom he showed in answering the rabbis. The rabbis were men of colossal intellect. They memorized Genesis to Deuteronomy. Back then, tradition was not passed by writing, but orally. They would pass it down orally. All they did was study, 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 study. Jesus' wisdom surpassed their wisdom. They hated him for that. Not because he did something wrong. There are people who do not like to see other people successful. They cannot endure it. And so they will find something to be angry at you or something to destroy you. And that's what they did with Jesus. Listen, his brothers heard. What did they hear? You see, listen, I didn't put it, it's too long. Jesus was going about healing. He was all over the place. He was all over the So they were complaining and saying, Ooh, this guy is doing all of this and all of that. He should stop. His brothers heard also the charge brought by the Pharisees that he has cast out devils through the power of Satan. They felt keenly the reproach that came upon them through their relation to Jesus. They said, they are accusing Jesus of casting out demons with demons. Jesus is our family. They accuse him, it looks bad for us. So what did they decide to do? They decided that he must be persuaded. Listen, listen, listen. Don't read ahead. Persuasion means to convince. Let's convince him to stop ministering. Let's convince him to stop preaching and telling these rabbis the truth because he's going to get our family in trouble. Our family name is at stake. Our reputation. Let us convince him to stop. Let's persuade him. But look at what they said. Or constrain. Constrain is to force. If he doesn't listen to our advice to stop, we are going to force him to stop. 
listen to this part, to seize his manner of labor, and they did what? Hello? They did what? They induced Mary, Mary the mother of Jesus. They went to Mary and they told Mary, we need to stop our brother. This has to end. He's gone too far. This has to end. Please. They induced Mary to unite with them, thinking that through his love for her, be careful with people who have control over you. Be careful with people who make you move, make you go, make you stay, make you act, make you speak. His love for her, they might prevail upon him to be prudent. Jesus loved his brothers in spite of all of this and treated them with unfailing but they were jealous of him and manifested the most decided unbelief and contempt. They could not understand his conduct. They couldn't. He did not strive for worldly greatness. He wasn't looking for worldly greatness, but because they hated him, they said, this guy is just trying to show off. And in even the lowliest position, he was content. This angered his brothers. The fact that he was okay with doing menial tasks, they could not account for his constant serenity under trial and deprivation. Under trial, he did not complain. He did not fight. He did not do evil. So they were angered with him. The fury increased. All this displeased his brothers. Listen to me. Jesus was growing up in a home where the hatred from his brothers was terrible. The hatred from his friends was terrible. They were trying to convince his mother to lead him to sin. They charged him with thinking himself superior to them and reapproved him for setting himself above their teachers and the priests and rulers of the people. Often they threatened and tried to intimidate him, but he passed on making the scriptures his God. Let me give you an advice this morning. Don't ever try to stop someone who is touched by God. You are not fighting God. I mean the person. You are fighting God. There's a preacher who said, and you cannot fight God because your hands are too short to box with God. Jesus and Mary, last part. Some of you are happy. Last part. Let's look at Jesus and Mary. We've looked at his friends. We've looked at his church and the rabbis. We have looked at his brothers. Look. 219 quickly come with me to Luke 219 Matthew Mark Luke chapter 2 I am there verse 19 and I'm reading the angel answered and said to him I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this news after this was spoken I want you to look at 251 251 51 says he has done mighty deeds with his arm he has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their hearts um, no 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 verse 51 I read the wrong one he has done mighty deeds with his arm he has scattered those who were proud in their thoughts of their hearts. Look at what Ellen White says. Stay with me. Respect and love for his mother. Jesus always respected and loved his mother. Mary believed in her what? Mary believed in her that the holy child born of her was the long promised. Yet she dared not express her faith. Throughout his life on earth, she was a partaker of his suffering. 
she witnessed with sorrow the trials brought upon him in his childhood and by her vindication of what she knew to be right in his conduct, she herself was brought in trying positions. If you want to be a mother one day, listen to this. Go down to the last one. I won't go read the other. The sons and daughters. By the way, Joseph also had daughters. Jesus had sisters. The sons and daughters of Joseph knew this. And they, by appealing to her anxiety, to Mary's anxiety, they tried to correct the practice of Jesus according to their standard. They judged Jesus according to the standard, and they were trying to use Mary to correct Jesus. So look at this part. They knew that no authority could be found in Scripture for their traditions. This is the rabbis. They realized that spiritual understa the spiritual understanding, Jesus was far in advance of them. Yet, they were angry because he did not obey their dictates. Falling to failing to convince him, they sought, they sought who? The rabbis could not stop Jesus from preaching the truth, so they went to Joseph and Mary, listen, and set before them his course of non-compliance. Your boy is naughty. Thus, he suffered rebuke and what? Mary and Joseph rebuked him for things he did not do because of the rabbis. There was one time when we were in South Africa. If you don't know my background, these accusations about me would have been true. So I turned off the lights. My sister, where is he? Hello. She was in the corridor heading to the room. I saw her coming. I turned off the light. I knelt like this. I didn't move. I just knelt. She walked. She was very young, very cute, very beautiful. You know, I started loving babies because of her. She, I, I love to hold her, just kiss her. I still kiss her on the cheek sometimes. So, as she was walking, it was dark. She couldn't see. She suddenly hit and she shouted. That it was a loud shout. My dad comes. Me, I step out, and my brother, <laughs> one a big mistake he made, he steps in. <laughs> so when the light come on, guess who received? And you think I will come out to say, no, it was me? No way. Silence. And my brother suffered the punishment for something he did not do. Jesus, the rabbis came and said, your son is misbehaving. We are tired. Who does he think he is? Who do Why doesn't he just bend? Why doesn't he just be like everyone else? Why doesn't he just follow the custom? Why doesn't he just go with the trend? Why not? Why does he have to, what is he trying to prove? So they rebuked Jesus. At a very early age, Jesus had begun to act for himself in the formation of his character. He began to act for who? For himself. And not even respect and love for his parents could turn him from obedience to? It is written, was his reason for every act. As I read this, I said to myself, it was around one, I couldn't sleep. Lord, is this true of me? Am I living like this? His reason for every act was the word that varied from the family customs. Even if the... But the influence of the rabbis made his life a bitter one. Even in his youth, had to learn hard lessons of silence and patience. Mary often remonstrated with Jesus and urged him to conform to the usages of the rabbis. She urged him. But he could not be persuaded 
to change his habit of contemplating the works of God and seeking to alleviate suffering of men or even of dumb animals. Jesus helped animals and humans. He did not endure the suffering of animals or humans. When the priests and teachers required Mary's aid in controlling Jesus, she was greatly troubled. But peace came to her heart as he presented the statements of the scriptures upholding his practices. When Mary was convinced that what Jesus is doing is wrong, as she came to try and tell him, don't do it, Jesus opened the Bible and said, Mother, I love you, I respect you, but you are not God. At times, she wavered between Jesus and his brothers. She did not believe that he was the sent son of, who did not believe, the brothers, not Mary, did not believe that he was the sent of, sent of God, but evidence was abundant that he was, his was a divine character. She saw his suff, sacrificing himself for the good of others. His presence brought pure atmosphere into the home. When Jesus went home, people were happy. They are fathers. When they come home, children hide. I've seen it. They are fathers. When they wake up to go to work, children are sleeping. When they come back, children are sleeping. Children are not happy. They don't run to their parents. They are scared. Harmless and undefiled, he walked among the thoughtless, rude, uncourteous, unjust, reckless, unrighteous, heathen, rough, mixed multitude. He spoke a word of sympathy here and a word there. As he saw men weary, yet compelled to bear heavy burdens, he shared their burdens. Jesus shared the burdens of people. There's no reason why someone in African congregation should go a day without eating. That happens because we don't have the love of God. You have been hungry before in your life. You have been despised before in your life. You know how bad it is. And if you know someone is suffering, how can you sleep? How can you smile? How can you rejoice and be at peace? He shared their burdens and repeated to them the lessons that he had learned from nature of the love, kindness, and goodness of God. When he went to Nazareth, his brothers and his sisters were there and they rejected him. Warren Wiersbe says familiarity breeds contempt. But he also says, Philip Brooks said, familiarity breeds contempt only with contemptible things or among contemptible people. They said they didn't accept him in Nazareth because they knew him. Familiarity breeds contempt. But he says only with incontemptible people. Meaning, if you are around people that do not desire to be godly, there will always be war. The righteous and the wicked cannot endure in the same place forever. It, two different things. Our standing before God. Where's Joseph? Get ready, please. Our standing before God depends not upon the amount of light we have received, but upon the use. Upon the what? I am not an entertainer. I'm not here to entertain. I almost did not want to preach this sermon. And I'm scared that I didn't say things as I was supposed to say them. I used to love to rebuke. Not anymore. This thing is heavy. It's not upon the light we've received, but upon the use of them. I'm not here to inform your mind so that you can live more informed about the Bible and the life of Jesus. It is for you to use these things. Thus, even the heathen who choose the right, as far as they can distinguish it, are in more favorable condition. Listen, there are people who don't know the truth that we know. They can go to heaven because they will be judged upon the light they've received. As with all of this light, we cannot go to heaven, they will go, even though they don't keep the Sabbath, even though they're eating pork, if they don't know, or whatever, they will go. 
The Bible clearly says many things we, ought, we shouldn't do. And some of us boast, oh, I know this. Oh, I do this. I am a Seventh-day Adventist. I am this and I am that. And then these ones, they are, they are not going to heaven. These ones are, you will not go to heaven. You will not go to heaven. You, we know what we should do. Allow me, Lord. I want to be free from people's blood. We know. We know. Things we neglect. Why must we always come late to church? Why? Why? Okay, if it was once, it's every time. All the t every time we come late. Every time. When will we stop gossiping? When? When? When will we stop watching things we know will lead us away from God? When? Even when we sit to watch them, the Holy Spirit reminds us, my friend, yes, later. When I need an exam, when I don't have money, I will call you, but now let me watch this thing. Let me enjoy. Later I will call you when I'm in trouble. Let me enjoy this. I'll call you later when I'm free. Right now I'm busy. Let me enjoy this. Read what's in color. But who disregard the light and they, their daily life contradict their profession? Their daily life contradict. I'm a Christian, but I smoke, I drink. Uh, these people had prided themselves on keeping the law, but they were ready to kill Jesus. Joseph, I think you can come and set up. In Jesus' home, he was under severe pressure. Mother, father, brothers. His church members were against him. His friends were against him. The disciples, until the point of his death, did not believe in him. Now it was time for him to come to do what he did. Matthew 26, 30 says, Before Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, he sang a hymn. Why did he sing a hymn? Jesus was under so much pressure. Look at verse 37. And he took with him Peter, James, and John, the sons of Zebedee, and he began to be in sorrow, and he was sore troubled. Then he said unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. I am in deep pain. This is before the cross, before Gethsemane. I am in so much pain, as I am dying. Stay with me, abide with me. Ellen White says, he groaned aloud. Jesus shouted when he was walking to the Mount of Olives in Gethsemane. And as if he's suffering under the pressure of a terrible burden, listen to this. This shocked me. Twice his companions supported him or he would have fallen to the earth. When Jesus was walking to Gethsemane, he was crying, he was shouting. The pain was so much, he couldn't bear it, he couldn't walk. He was about to fall twice, but they had to pick him up. He went a little distance from them, and he fell poor straight to the ground. He couldn't bear it anymore. He fell to the ground, and he gripped the ground. The gulf was so broad, so black, so deep, that his spirit shuddered before it. This agony, he must not exert his divine power to escape. As man, he must suffer the consequences of man's sin. As man, he must endure the wrath of God against transgression. He did not use his divinity. And he was bearing this alone. The Bible says he had internal bleeding. The pain was so much. No one beat him. He was not yet scored. He was already bleeding, sweating blood. This is the right description. Ellen White says when he got there, he gripped the ground. There were demons all around. The devil was telling him, don't die for them. They will reject you. They will not obey you. Turn away. If you leave, you will not die. It was so dark that it looked like he was not going to come back again. It was extremely painful that it caused internal bleeding as he agonized. And he asked the disciples to pray for him, but they were sleeping. There was no one beside him. They were sleeping. His brothers were saying, you deserve it. They, were, they, they left him. 
Matthew 26, 50 says, they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. Now listen to this. They laid hands on him and they grabbed him. After they grabbed him, verse 30, 51 says, Peter drew his sword and Peter, he cut off the ear of, a, this is a disciple who was with Jesus three years and a half. He was walking with a knife. Okay. He didn't go home and get a knife. He was walking with a knife. He takes it out, cuts the ear. But listen, Jesus was first bound. Listen very carefully. There's something important here. G when they came, they bound his hand. And then, after they bound his hand, Peter takes the sword. And Peter cuts the ear. What did Jesus do after that? He did what? But listen, the Bible says they first bound his hand. How did he heal? And you know what he did? He gave them back his hand. Do you understand what Jesus has done? Huh? When they came to arrest him and they tied him, he gave his hand. When the ear of that man was off, Jesus removed. Listen, Jesus was not taken because he had no strength to deliver himself. Okay? He removed it. And then he healed, and then he gives them his hand. Helen White says this. They were disappointed and indignant as they saw the cords brought forward to bind his hands. So she also, they bound his hands first. Of him whom they loved, Peter in his anger drew the sword and tried to defend his master. Look at the last in color. When Jesus saw what was happened, he released his own hands. He released his own hands though held what though held what he was held firmly by roman soldiers you think Havi and the son of big ah these are babies roman soldiers were strong they tied jesus and they held his hand and that's when peter they held his hand that's when peter takes the sword and cuts the ear jesus removes his hand heals and then gives them his hand he could have left, but he knew that I need salvation. He knew that you need salvation. And because of that, he stayed and he gave back his hands. He was betrayed, forsaken, arrested, questioned, struck, bound, denied, scourged, crown of thorns, and so forth. But against all odds, against all pressure from home as a youth, from his friends, from the rabbis, from Mary, from Joseph. He committed no sin. He did no wrong. Against all odds, he grew as a tender plant on dry ground. That's what Isaiah means when he says he grew on dry ground. The odds against him seemed impossible. It was too much to bear. And so when he was on the cross, his last words... He's dying. He's dying. His church is killing him. His family has forced the disciples run away. He's alone on that cross. He looks down and he says, John, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. When he was on the cross, he was not thinking about himself. He was thinking, who's going to take care of my mother when I'm gone? John, take care of my mother. And then he looks at those who are persecuting him. He says, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. They didn't ask him for forgiveness. I will only forgive people when they come and talk to me. They didn't ask him for forgiveness. For all his life, he was in agony and pain. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. Forgive them. Do not allow bad people to turn you bad. Do not allow bad situation to turn you into a bad person. Jesus was firm. It is interesting that we long for Jesus to forgive us, but we do not want to forgive people. We want to be free, but we don't want other people to be free. It is very selfish. And Jesus died on that cross. 
as Joseph plays the song and as he sings, I want you to meditate on the words of this song. Jesus died, but Jesus didn't just die. Three days later, he resurrected. Because he resurrected, there's hope. Because he resurrected, there's victory. Because he resurrected, we can face all odds. The incorruptible Jesus lives. He's not in the tomb. And this same Jesus is coming again. When he came, he came for all. When he lived, he lived as an example for all. When he died, he died for all. It's John 3, 16, for the world, that the world may be saved. When he resurrected, he resurrected for all. When he ascended into heaven, he ascended for all. He ministers in the heavenly courts, he ministers for all. But his second coming is not for all. It's not for all. It's not for all. You know yourself. You know yourself. You know yourself. If you don't need salvation, you don't need forgiveness, don't come up front. If you do, I want to pray for you. And as Joseph plays, come up front. is coming in a little while we are going home the day approaches faster than we know soon we'll behold our God and we hear from his voice it's time My joy will be to see you there. Hold on, be strong. The King shall come. What a joy when we will see the city of God. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, my home. And we don't understand the reason why. But we have this hope, our fate shall be sight. The loved ones you have lost, God will bring. When we hear from His voice, it's done we can go home my joy will be to see you there hold on be strong the king shall come what a joy when we will see the city of God Jerusalem Jerusalem, Jerusalem, my home. It's time to get back to the truth we have lost. The time shows clearly this world is our end. Oh, come, please. Come, no one can replace your 
apart Jerusalem 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 my home 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 Jesus stays is my home Jerusalem I long to be there another opportunity to someone anyone who's out there and you know you should be here I want to make sure I give enough time it was hard to speak what I spoke I didn't want to almost but I know God has a reason I don't understand fully but if you're here today and God has spoken to you please come up front and let me pray for you before we end this morning. If you're out there, God has spoken to you. Come up front. Father, thank you for the strength. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Lord in heaven, we have come before you this morning. Please forgive us. We've sinned against you in thoughts, in action, intentionally, Lord, time and time and time again. Please forgive us. Father, your people have come up front. Many with heavy hearts, Lord. Troubled hearts, burdened hearts, hearts that are heavy. They cannot carry them anymore, gracious Lord. Father, thank you for the burden. Lord, please relieve me. Relieve them. Give us peace that surpasses understanding. There are addictions that are binding us to Lucifer. There are forces drawing us back and we love them. In Jesus' name, fill us with hatred for wickedness. Give us a double portion of your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, as you have spoken to me and given me strength, give them more so that we can live the message. Father, when all is said and done, I pray that our names may be found in the book of life. Lord, I have a special request this morning. I ask for those that came I plead with you, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Please, Lord, at this moment, right now, Holy Spirit, may you please 
dwell within them abundantly. Bless them spiritually. Bless them physically. Bless them mentally. Provide for them financially. May they prosper in all that they do. May you walk with them. May they find favor in your sight and favor with men. Lord, bless their families and give them strength to walk in accordance with your will. I thank you, Father, for hearing this prayer. And I thank you because I know you have answered. Thank you for your presence in this place. Please stay, Lord. Please stay. Bring us back for AY. I pray that the plans of the devil may not prevail this morning, this afternoon. This is our humble prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. God bless you all. Our closing song, we will stand and sing Jesus paid it all. Let's stand. Father, thank you for speaking. 
Holy Spirit, please abide with us and grace us with your healing presence. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.